plus B going to A, B, what is that? It's a synthesis reaction, right? And if I have A, B going to A plus B, then it's a decomposition, right? Um, a plus B, C going to A, C plus B, that's a single replacement, right? And then A, B plus C, D going to A, D plus C, B. So a double replacement or displacement. And then the last one is combustion. Notice the oxygen forming CO2 and water. And so when you see that, you know it's a combustion reaction. Cool? And so those are the types of reactions that we're learning to identify at this point. Now, there's something else that I want to talk to in this uh, conversation about reaction, and it's driving, I'm gonna start here on this reaction, or on these reactions, and then I'm gonna move into the official slides for this. But all of these reactions have driving forces that are, are happening and are, are things that go on to make a lower energy relationship normally. But if I'm looking at this, I've got iron and oxygen reacting. You guys see that? And if I, we've talked about oxidation states and how to determine an oxi oxidation state of an element or of a element in a compound, right? And so if I'm looking up here and I have an element in its elemental form, what's its oxidation number always? An element in its elemental form. Its oxidation state is, there's a number, it's zero, okay? And so if I'm looking, it's iron zero plus oxygen zero, okay? But if I'm looking at what happens to it, you guys see that the iron is no longer zero. What is it? <clears throat> is it plus two? The oxygen is minus two, right? And there's three of them. The oxygen is almost minus two, except with peroxide or with fluorine. And so if I'm looking at this and there's three times minus two, that's a total of minus six. So how many pluses do I need? Six pluses, so there's two irons, so that's plus three, right? I just did algebra. And so that's iron plus three. So it's going from zero to plus three and from zero to minus two. When that happens, when I have oxidation numbers that are changing values, what do we call it? There's a name for this. Oxidation reduction, right? And so the iron is being oxidized, the oxygen is being reduced, and so we have an oxidation reduction reaction that's occurring. That drives this reaction, okay? That's the word that a chemist would use. Yeah, it's an oxidation reduction, and so that's what's driving that to happen. If I'm looking at this decomposition and I'm looking at this, then do we see the same thing here? What's the oxidation state of the hydrogen on the left-hand side? Bound with oxygen. What's the hydrogen on the left-hand side? If oxygen is always minus two, Hydrogen's a plus one, and there's two of them, right? So that two, so that balances out. What is it here with as H2 gas? Everybody? As H2, every it's its elemental form? It's zero. Okay? So I didn't get everybody, I got one person, but hopefully everybody was saying it in their head together. All right? How about let's try it again? Oxygen, what's its oxidation number? O2? Zero. All right. So we've got that going. If I'm looking here, do we see some changes going on with Cl? So if I'm looking at the Cl here, it's with three oxygens, right? For a total of minus one for that ion. And over here, it becomes a minus one. So it's actually a plus seven. It's a plus seven on that side. Now, I haven't taught you how to do that as well for those types of compounds and we'll work on that, okay? But, so I see this Cl is going from a plus seven to a minus one, and my oxygen is going from a minus two to a zero. So what do we have going on right there? 
What type of reaction? Oxidation reduction. So what's the driving force behind decomposition reactions commonly? Oxidation reduction. What is the driving force on synthesis? Oxidation reduction. Okay. So now if we move down, we see the same thing here. A plus BC going to AC plus B. And so the zinc's oxidation state is what on this side? It's zinc metal. Zero, right? If I look over here, it's with two CLs. CLs are what? Minus, minus one. Yeah, there's two of them. So what's the zinc over here? It, plus two, yeah, plus two. So it goes from zero to plus two. It's being oxidized. Can you find what's being reduced? What's being reduced? Can you identify that? Am I giving you enough time? How many people would say the hydrogen? Yeah, the hydrogen is going from, oops, find it, plus one right here to zero, okay? I, I'm, I'm trying to walk, I want you to be able to see these. We're doing a whole bunch of these, right? Because I want you guys to look at a reaction and say, oh, that's being oxidized, that's being reduced, right? That's something, it's a skill that is really useful for chemistry, okay? Now, if I'm looking at this double replacement, there's something else going on here, because if I'm looking, this K is plus one, it's plus one here, right? Would you guys agree with that? And the lead is what? Can you identify the oxidation state of the lead? There's two nitrates. What's nitrate always? Minus one. What's the lead? Everybody together? Plus two, right? So it's plus two right here. And look, it's with iodide, there's two of them. What is it on that side? It's still plus two, isn't it? It's not changing, you guys catching that? And there's nothing in this that changes, the nitrate changes. Now, if I want you to see what's happening, what does this say right here? What does this say? What does this say? What is this one? What was made as a result of combining these two salts? A precipitate, right? So this is what type of reaction? Precipitation reaction, all right? So this double replacement is driven by the precipitation of the lead iodide, okay? So the driving force here is different than the other reactions, okay? You can also get the formation of a gas. That's something that would drive one of these reactions. Okay, just to let you know that. In an acid-base reaction, then that's another case of double um, uh, replacement. And so we're looking right here. Now notice aqueous, 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 and what's the last one? Liquid. And so the formation of water, the pure water, is what drives that reaction. So it could be a precipitation, could be the formation of a gas, or could be the formation of pure water. You guys with me? So it could be any of those. But if you'll notice that H plus is still plus one on both sides, the potassium is plus one and so on. Then they don't change, ox there's no oxidation reduction that's occurring there, okay? So now, what about the last one? Is there, what drives it? So we've been practicing this, can you identify it? What's the oxygen on the left-hand side? What's its oxidation state? That one's easy to see. It's zero. What is it on the right? It's minus two, isn't it? Because it's minus two in this compound and minus two in that one, right? Now, those are perceived charges because what type of bonding is that? It's covalent, right? And so they're not actually charged. We're doing perceived charges on those, okay? Because they're not ions. But the oxidation state definitely changed. And so from zero to um, some value to be combined with each of these. And so that means the oxygen is being reduced in that case. 
And what's being oxidized? What gains oxygen? The hydrocarbon, right? So the hydrocarbon, the hydrogen, and the oxygen are both gaining those. But now if we look at that, then the hydrogen is not changing oxidation state, it's the carbon. And so when you look at that closely, that's not shown because we're using X, Y right there. And so anyway, cool? Yeah, all right. Identify the reaction type for each of these equations. This is practice to just get the reaction type, not what's driving it. But the first one, what type of reaction is that? Synthesis, right? What about the second one? Double replacement. What about the third one? Decomposition. And then what about the last one? Combustion reaction. Yeah. So good. Good job, guys. So there's the solutions of that. So what I started talking about on that last side, because I, I don't think there's enough examples, okay? Well, starting to identify driving forces for reactions and aqueous solutions. Reactions occur spontaneously due to combination of changes in heat energy, randomness, and we're going to, in fact, talk about those relationships to give free energy in the future, okay? And so we can start doing energetic calculations related to this. In fact, in lab, we're going to introduce enthalpy in that relationship to heat as part of lab this week, okay? So to make that connection, all right? Spontaneous reactions follow typical patterns classified by their driving force and driving forces are associated with the formation of stable lower energy products. And so you guys should be ahead of me on this, these next couple slides, but and double replacement reactions, precipitation is something that occurs or the formation of water or other, some other small molecule. Neutralization is a driving force for acid bases. And so anyway, single replacements and decomposition reactions are oxidation reduction. And so anyway, identify the driving forces. So we've done enough examples now. I think that you guys can get this. What is driving this first reaction? Oxidation, everybody agree with oxidation reduction? Yep, I agree with that. How about the second one? What drives the second reaction? Precipitation, yeah, what's precipitating? Can you identify that? What compound? Silver iodide, right? So AGI is precipitating, all right? And what about in the last one? What's going on there? It's a decomposition, isn't it? And so, what drives the oxidation reduction react or drives a decomposition? I said that backwards, didn't I? Oh, I love my brain. So anyway, it was oxidation reduction. Can you identify the change that's going on? representing the dissociation of ionic compounds uh, when they dissolve in water. And we're going to identify compounds being as strong as electrolytes, weak electrolytes, or non-electrolytes from the chemical formulas. I'm going to bring a demo next time, okay? And so it's kind of a fun demo. And so from this lesson today, I'm going to ask you guys to make some predictions, okay? And so when I have a solid compound that dissolves in water, it's got to be one of two things. It's got to be either a salt, which is soluble, and when it dissolves, then it forms an electrolyte in solution, okay? The other option would be that it would be highly polar, okay? And polar molecules will dissolve in water too. But if I take a polar molecule and dissolve it in water, it is a non-electrolyte, 
okay? The covalently bonded molecule can be polar without being charged. Anybody give me a nice molecule? What about sugar? Okay, sugar is a covalent molecule. If I take a big spoonful of uh, table sugar and put it into water and stir it, what happens? It dissolves, doesn't it? But it doesn't become an electrolyte, and we'll prove this physically uh, on Wednesday, okay? So anyway, now, when I have something that is not soluble, such as lead iodide or silver iodide or silver chloride or those types of things, and we're looking at the notation, then we see that that has precipitated out. It's not dissolved. There's very, very little of that in solution, okay? Now, we're gonna teach you some mathematics next semester, equilibrium mathematics, and we're gonna start talking about equilibrium expressions and for example, KSP, and there's a value called KSP that's associated with that silver chloride solid, which there is a very, very little amount that we can predict or make approximations as to how much would be present, okay? And so we'll teach you that mathematics next semester uh, when we come back. And so anyway, and in fact, we're doing more of that in my quant class right now, a lot of equilibrium mathematics using K values and, uh, and equilibrium expressions. And so I'll work very hard to get you guys good at that in here. And then when you go to quant, then you'll do an excellent job there. So that's, that's my goal anyway. All right. Many reactions happen in aqueous solution that would not happen if the same reactions were mixed as solids. One reason is that the dissolved compounds are more mobile, and so they're likely to run into each other. You have to have a collision for a reaction to happen. If it can't move and there can't be a collision, then we don't get anything going. All right. And another reason is the like ionic compounds behave when dissolved in water, and so they do cool things and form hydrated spheres and travel and, and all kinds of fun stuff. But anyway, ionic compounds disassociated into individual ions and disperse among water molecules. Sodium chloride forms separate sodium ions and Cl ions and they're known as hydrated ions and they have a sphere of hydration, which actually affects how they move in the solution, right? How they travel and you can even get them to separate in chromatography or electrophoresis uh, based on that. So anyway, uh, after the formula of an ionic compound, the AQ indicates that it's dissolved, and obviously the S means that it is, is solid. So if I'm looking on the left-hand side in the way that is drawn, is that dissolved or is that in its solid form? It's in its solid form, and so that's the ionic lattice. If I take those same ions and I dissolve them, then I end up with hydrated ions. And what we are not showing here is that those can expand depending on the charge. And right, yeah, so they vary in size. This is showing a simplified with, wait a minute, what's the red right there in this little molecule with the Mickey Mouse ears? Water. It's oxygen, right? And what's the two whites? Hydrogens, and you guys remember when we talked about polarity, right? And we had our water. So we had oxygen and two hydrogens. And so we can look at that. And the hydrogens are partially positive. The oxygen is partially negative. We could have drawn one like this. And so we can show that, identify those partial charges. So why is the oxygen focused onto the positively charged one? Because it's electronegative. And why is the hydrogen on the negative one then? Because it's electropositive and positives and negatives do what? Attract, okay? And so this can be observed. And so we know this to be the case in solutions. Fun stuff? Yeah, a little identification here, electrolytes. And so what happens is that when those ions get dissolved, right, 
not only do they have this relationship to make these spheres, but it allows a path for electrons to move through the water, okay? And so those charged things in the water allow for electrons to be able to move. And so when that ionic compound completely dissolves, it's known as a strong electrolyte. And yeah, you can conduct electricity readily. It's the best way to say it. You can conduct electricity readily. And so, like I said, we'll prove that. This is showing that relationship. And so compounds must both be soluble and ionic to be able to move charge. And so in fact, if I put electrodes in there, I can get my ions to move. If I have the same thing with an ionic solid, they're trapped in the lattice and they can't move. So ionic solids are poor conductors of electricity where ionic solutions are high conductors of electricity. Did you guys catch that? Be a good test question, right? You can switch that in. An ionic solid is a poor conductor of electricity, okay? An ionic liquid is a good one, right? So I can write a test question which says either ionic solid or ionic liquid, and then I can just change those from test to test. You guys get that? Do I do things like that? Yes. Okay. All test authors do those fun type questions. All right, this is the activity. I'm gonna do this in, in person, is that all right? So I'm gonna skip this one. You guys can play with that if you want to. Non-electrolytes, okay? Most electric compounds that dissolve in water and solutions do not conduct electricity, okay? What would be a good example of a non-electrolyte that dissolves? I gave you one. Sugar, would it be anything that dissolves? Right, in water, it would have to be polar enough. What about alcohol? What about ethanol? Does it dissolve in water? Does it mix with water? Should be the way I ask that, yeah. Right, so did, would it conduct electricity? No. Okay, so anyway, so just throwing those out there. So it has to ionize, right, to produce ions to get that to happen. Now, this is showing strong acid, right? Is a strong acid going to conduct electricity? Absolutely, okay? What about, I'm gonna ask a question. What about this molecule? All right, is water a good conductor of electricity or poor conductor of electricity? Pure water. It's a poor conductor of electricity. Right? If I have pure water, it's a poor conductor of electricity. It's not charged, is it? It doesn't have its own ions to be able to move electricity. Now, if I take pure water and I hit it with a bolt of lightning, right, which has a whole bunch of excess electrons that are trying, is trying to get them to move, right? And will it force something to become ionized? The answer is yes, okay? And so then we can move large volumes of electrons at that point. But doesn't that same thing happen to insulated wire in your home when your lightning strikes? Doesn't it blow the insulation completely off the wires and in fact sometimes catch them on fire? Yeah, so that's not the circumstance I'm talking about. The circumstance I'm talking about is when I'm doing conductivity measurements and when I have pure water, the conductivity of the water is very, very low, okay? We make deionized water in our laboratories and it gets down to about 18 ohms of resistance. And so, yeah, just throwing that out there, okay? Cool? All right, molecular compounds. So. This is a list of strong acids. I, if you stay in chemistry, you have to know these, okay? I'm just saying you need to learn which acids are strong and there's common ones that we use. HCl a lot, HNO3 a lot, 
hydrochloric, nitric, right? Sulfuric, perchloric, and chloric acids are used occasionally, okay? So these are strong acids and you guys should know them, okay? Now, wait a minute. What does it mean to be a strong acid or a strong electrolyte? Those are synonymous. I dissolve completely in water, right? I disassociate completely. I, if I put in one molar concentration, then I have, if it's HCl, I have two moles of ions, one mole of H plus and one mole of Cl minus, okay? And that's what it means that it disassociates completely. When we start talking about things that are weak, then we start using the K language, right? The equilibrium expressions. And what we'll find is the weaker they are, the smaller the value of the K. Okay? The weaker they are, the smaller the value of the K. Now, it's a ratio of products over reactants from a reaction. Okay? It's a ratio of products over reactants. And so the more reactant favored, the uh, smaller that value for the reactants. And so the bigger the, the value, okay? So anyway, weak acids are electrolytes and they are uh, weak acids and weak uh, compounds. And so anyway, weak's only partially ionized. Now there's gonna be some other chemistry I teach you too, and it's gonna be about buffers, okay? And buffers are made out of weak acids, weak bases. Okay, combination of those two. And so anyway, and then I'm also gonna teach you some acid-base language, which would go with this in this conjugate acids and bases. And so when I have a strong acid, it's base, conjugate base is a very weak base. When I have a strong base, then the conjugate acid is, is gonna be very weak. And so it's gonna be some language that we're gonna learn in addition to this, okay? Strong bases, ionic compound containing hydroxide ions. What? When, when I'm doing Bronsted acids and bases, then we're talking about H plus and OH minus. When you get into organic chemistry, you're gonna get a new definition and it's gonna be Lewis acids and bases. And what we're gonna find is that other elements can act as acids. And so we'll, we'll work on that in the future too. Just to let you know that. But anyway, strong disassociate 100% in water. Now there's some solubility issues that we're gonna learn about too. And then weak bases are molecular compounds such as ammonia, and they react with water to produce very small amounts of hydroxide, and they are weak electrolytes, all right? So various compounds, strong electrolyte, weak electrolyte, relationship, strong is ionic salts, ionic bases, and strong acids. And then weak electrolytes, weak acid or weak base. And then the non-electrolyte, they're giving the nice example of sugar right there. So it's just the one I used earlier. Cool, so that's kind of a summary slide of the different types of things that we can talk about. All right, classify the following water soluble substances as strong electrolytes, weak electrolytes, or non-electrolytes in aqueous solution. What about the first one, what do you think? Calcium chloride. Most chlorides are soluble, strong, strong electrolyte, okay? What about the second one? Non-electrolyte, that's correct, all right? What about this one? Strong, so it's still a strong electrolyte, but we have another name for that one too. HNO2, HNO3 is nitric acid, right? Do what? It's a strong acid, yeah. And so what about this one? It's a weak electrolyte, right? It's also a weak base, okay? It says it right there, that's funny to me. Um, so it would still be a weak electrolyte, right? In terms of what we're doing right here. This would be a strong electrolyte. And then this one, KOH, strong electrolyte, and it's a strong, well, there's another word I'd use for it, strong base, yeah. And 
HBr. Strong acid, so that would make it a strong electrolyte, okay? And so I want you guys to be able to see those and identify that. Let's see how we did. Strong electrolyte, non-electrolyte, weak electrolyte, weak electrolyte, strong electrolyte, and strong electrolyte. Not bad, okay? Not bad at all. All right. Precipitation reactions, all right? So, ionic compounds that dissolve in water are soluble, and ionic compounds that do not readily dissolve are considered insoluble. And there's actually a solubility table in 8.5, okay, that you can look up the solubility. And in fact, the next semester, one of the first labs that we do is a lab which does qualitative analysis. And it uses the solubility tables that we're going to learn about in this chapter to actually do chemical analysis. And so we're gonna use relationships of whether things form a solid or if they don't to separate them into different categories, okay? And so it's some really fun chemistry. And it's one of my favorite labs just to let you know. But this is a table that's really useful for the lab, okay? And so if we're looking at this, then what we notice is right here, lithium, sodium, potassium, and ammonia, okay? Now, wait a minute, I just went down this family. Do you guys see this? And so a rule goes with this in, in my brain, and it's all alkali metals are soluble. All salts of alkali metals are soluble. So if I'm looking across here, soluble, 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 soluble. You guys with me? So all alkali metals are, salts of alkali metals are soluble, okay? Now, there's also some anions that are the same way, okay? All nitrate salts are soluble. You guys with me? All chlorate perchlorate salts are soluble and acetate. So if you'll notice, every one of these metals is soluble in these relationships with these ions, okay? Now, if I move over one, right, you guys with me? I'm now chloride, bromide, and iodide. Almost all halides are soluble, okay? Except, right, for just a few, silver, mercury, and lead. You guys see that right here? Everything else is soluble, okay? So that means that if I have silver nitrate in solution, and I put some sodium chloride in there with it, what's going to happen? A solid's gonna form. And what type of reaction? I'm taking two salts, I'm dissolving them in solution, I'm pouring them together. What type of reaction is that? Precipitation reaction. And so there's another general name for that that we learned, right, in the last couple of class periods. It's a what, double? replacement, right? It's driven by precipitation, okay? So that's the way a chemist looks at that. Now, if I move over, for example, to sulfate, what do I see about sulfate's solubility? Is it different than the halides and different than the other polyatomic ions? It's a lot less soluble, isn't it? It's soluble with the, well, all alkali metals are soluble, right? We already know that one. And, but if it's also soluble with magnesium, but if I go down, then, well, there's one, two, this is slightly soluble, and two more insoluble. So almost everything is insoluble with the sulfate. Even gets worse with these, right? So the carbonate, the uh, sulfite, the uh, phosphate and chromate, and we see that only the alkali metals are soluble. So if I want to get a metal out of solution, right, I have 
a metal in there, let's say magnesium, and I want to remove the magnesium with chemistry, then I could add sodium phosphate to the solution, and what's gonna happen? It's gonna precipitate the magnesium, isn't it? Okay, so that's useful to know that. Anyway, so you guys figured out how this table works? Could you guys use this to determine whether something was soluble or not? Yeah, now, could you then, if you know when something is soluble, predict whether a reaction would occur or not? guys finish this reaction and tell me whether it would occur or not? Now, both of these are aqueous, right? Because we know, looking up there at that table, all nitrates are soluble. You guys with me? And so I would know to write an AQ with that, right? And then what about all alkali metal salts? They're soluble, and so I can put my AQ right here. Now, I want you guys to finish this. You can. Identify your positive ions and your negative ions, okay? Identify your positive ions and your negative ions. And what type of reaction are we doing? You figured that out yet? Double replacement, right? So we're doing a double replacement. put barium phosphate as a solid, right? Now remember the barium is plus two, right? And the phosphate is minus three, right? So to balance that, there's three bariums and two phosphates. Does that take a little practice? Yeah. All right. Now I have a question, another question. Is this balanced? Not yet. Can we balance it too using the same rules that we were doing? And the answer is yes, right? And so if we balance these first, right, because they're on both sides as the phosphate, I have two over there, and so I have two of the sodium phosphates. And then if I start on this left-hand side, then I would want to put a three in front of the barium, which that means that now I have six nitrates, and I have one here, so I would put a six right there. And then when I get to the sodium, then two times three is six, and so now I'm balanced. So we just wrote a reaction, okay? We pulled it from a table. That's what I did, I just pulled things that I knew would be make an insoluble product to drive the reaction, okay? Now, if I had put, last thing, What 
would you guys write on the right hand side of that arrow and why? How many people would write no reaction? Remember, all alkali metal salts are soluble, right? And all nitrates are soluble and all perchlorates are soluble. So anything I would make, well, I don't make anything that would stay together. There is no precipitation, formation of a small molecule or anything. Nothing drives this to make a reaction happen. And so we're combining those first parts of this chapter to get to a place where we can identify when a reaction would even occur. Okay? So, or when it occurs, what drives it. So I'm done for today. That's what we're going to pick up next time is with our solubility chart. Okay?